All right, hi everybody. Thank you all so much for coming and for braving the snow. We're really glad to see you here. You made it. Um, my name is Molly Silverberg. I work here at BAM in the Education and Humanities Department, which organizes these talks along with our master class and our literary programming. Um, we're very excited to be streaming this event live today. This is something new that we're doing. So I want to welcome all of you who might be watching on either BAM.org or BAM's YouTube video channel. Um, definitely let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to hear from you. You can also use the hashtag on Coleridge on Twitter. Um, we've entered into a new age here at BAM and really want to hear um, your comments on the talk. Uh, we're really thrilled to have with us today Richard Holmes, who's the preeminent author and biographer to talk about the life and works of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the uh, controversial leader of the British Romantic movement. As many of you may know, BAM is currently presenting a production of Coleridge's Rime of the Ancient Mariner with Fiona Shaw. It's over in the Harvey Theater. It'll be running until the end of next week and if you haven't gotten your tickets yet I'd encourage you really to go and see it it's quite a spectacular event um, Richard Holmes is an award-winning British author best known for his biographical studies of major figures of British and Fran French romanticism including most relevant to our purposes here today Coleridge early visions and Coleridge darker Refle reflections he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a fellow of the British Academy and in 1992 he was awarded the Order of the British Empire among many other works he most recently published falling upwards how we took to the air a book that follows the pioneer generation of balloon aeronauts and explores the interplay between technology and imagination. And as you can see over here, there are some books from sale from Greenlight, and there will be a book signing following the event. So I encourage you to pick up a book. Um, at the end of his lecture, Richard will also be taking questions from the audience. For those of you who are watching via our live stream, you can um, submit your questions throughout the talk using the hashtag on Coleridge on Twitter. Um, so please, without further Without further ado, join me in welcoming Richard Holmes. Well done for making it. <laughs> and now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald. The ancient mariner says it for you. Whether there are icebergs in, uh, in the park at the moment, I'm not sure. But it's a great pleasure. I've flown across here uh, for 24 hours from London because of Fiona Shaw's wonderful uh, rendition of the Mariner. And I want to ask just right at the beginning, who here has actually seen the Fiona Shaw production? Okay, and who's going to see it this evening? Ah, good. And who has no plans to see it at all? Mm, good, because I was going to say, to you I'm particularly talking, all right. Um, that's good, so I know where we are. Um, it's an extraordinary poem. It's in seven parts. It's thin and long on the page. 135 stanzas, about 660 lines. It takes about 20 minutes to read, and it takes Fiona Shaw about 45 minutes to go through it. And I will be referring to her performance and its strengths, and also certain interesting uh, light it throws on the uh, the extended qualities of the poem, the metaphysical qualities of the poem. Most interesting of all, perhaps for our purposes this evening, it is probably the most illustrated poem, adult poem, in the English language after Paradise Lost. And that's for very particular reasons. And one of the things I want to do today is show you quite a number of illustrations, and also some of the visual impact uh, of the poem, but also of Coleridge himself. So we'll, we'll go through this as we go along, and I hope this raises certain questions. Um, I call the poem a thin poem, but of course it's an epic. And in a way, I want you to start by 
clearing the ground and think in terms of sea epics, sea dramas, sea disasters. Think, for example, of Melville's Moby Dick. Think, for example, of James Cameron's film, The Titanic. Think of Jaws, right? Right, yes. Because the grotesque and the black humorous is all part of this poem. Now, what do those have in common? They're to do with the experience of something that happens out, far out in the sea, and something completely unexpected erupts. It may be the great white whale, it may be the great white iceberg, or it may be that great shark. Something happens out there that no one has expected, and a lot of people die as a result. And some people, or one person, comes back. So it's a story of a survivor from a sea disaster. And there is a sense, you can start this poem, think of it as a disaster movie, because it has very many movie-type qualities. If you were asked, very simply now, what's the poem about? You might say, oh, it's about a sailor who shot an albatross. It's a Mervyn Peak illustration, one of many I would show. Or you might say, it's about a ship with a crew of 201 who sail out southwards across the equator, down into the Antarctic Ocean, and disaster strikes. And all of them die of drought on the way back, except one. And so it's the story of that one person who comes back from that disaster. Now, the interesting thing at that point is what credibility, what authenticity do we give to the mariner? And there are several possible ways, and we'll go through this, of looking or interpreting the poem or looking at it. And one would be quite a modern way of looking at it, and many ways a convincing one, is you could say this is an extraordinary premonition. It's a study in what we call post-traumatic stress disorder or syndrome. Something terrible has happened to the mariner, who was young at the time, and when he gets back, he has irrational hallucinations about what has happened. He feels guilty, above all, he feels guilty, somehow responsible for it, and he has compulsive need to tell his story again and again. That's post-traumatic disorder, all right? So you could say it's a study in that and of the hallucinations that go with it. <coughs> you could say, on the other hand, no, it's more metaphysical than that. It is about some kind of spiritual experience, some kind of going right to the edge of human possibility, a place, to quote the poem, where God did not seem there to be. So it could have a spiritual reading, and indeed a Christian reading. That's possible. A third one might be that actually it's to do with Coleridge's experience, his own experience of opium addiction. We know how important that is in his story, and I will talk about that. And in some ways, this is a reflection, and particularly the strange hallucinatory experiences and the feelings of guilt are to do with that, what we now call drug addiction. So it could be, in some way, a confessional poem. So that's three entirely different ways of looking at it. There may be a fourth, which we may get to by the end. So I want you to bear those three in mind as I talk and see which sounds the most convincing explanation of what I'm saying. So first of all, I am going to, Fiona Shaw gives you an actor's account of this poem. I'm going to give you a biographer's account. And first of all, very quickly, just to remind you, um, here's a little outline, very approximate outline, because it's a complicated poem. And the time sequences in the poem are complicated. As you remember, there's the wedding guest, 
who interrupts at various points. There's the ancient mariner, ancient and return, but also as a young mariner. And the levels of the hallucination are quite complicated. So we'll look at those. But first of all, let me just take you through. I want to use one of the most famous illustrations, which is Gustav um, Doré's Ancient Mariner, which was published in 1876. Doré, who was a French illustrator who came to London in the 1870s, started illustrating Dickens's work, and then read The Ancient Mariner and was so struck and haunted by it that he made this series of, uh, in fact, in all, probably 40 drawings, uh, 40 engravings. And I just want to use those just to remind you, very basically, of the complexity of the story. It begins with a ship merrily setting forth from a harbour, and we'll talk about that harbour in a moment, and sailing southwards, southwards right across the equator and down towards the Antarctic. Very important thing to realise, there had of course been Captain James Cook's voyages, but no one knew at this time, at this date, 1797, that there was an Antarctic continent. It had never been seen. No one knew what happened at the South Pole, whether there was land, whether anybody could live there, whether other creatures could live there. No one knew. No one had been there. So it really was, Courage is taking the mariner down into terra incognita. So southward they go, and they get into the Antarctic Ocean, and they're surrounded with the ice, which I just quoted from that stanza. Um, and they're longing to get out because they're ice-bound, and they're praying for a wind. And the south wind from the south does come and begins to move them back towards home. And with the wind comes the albatross. And they look at it as a symbol of good fortune. And at that moment, and this is in the part one, part one of the poem, the last verse is this. Suddenly the mariner shoots the albatross that they had assumed was bringing it good luck and happy weather taking them home. And the extraordinary, one of the many extraordinary things about the poem is there's no explanation of why he's done it. And in fact, we don't even know. The wedding guest says, why lookst thou so? And then the mariner says, because I shot the albatross with my crossbow. I shot the albatross. And that's the first of the mysteries, and we'll come back to that. Why? Why did the mariner shoot the albatross? They are becalmed on the equator, and the albatross is hung round the neck of the mariner, then still young, because the crew all blame him for what is happening. They suffer from drought. In fact, they begin to die. Wonderful descriptions of the throats of the crew, like filled, like soot. And then, on the horizon, the first of the great hallucinations, a spectre ship arrives with two figures on it. And one is death, a skeleton. And one is a woman, the nightmare, life in death. And they play dice for the life of the whole crew. Now, this is very, very strange. What are they doing there? This is what the navigator believes he's seen. They're not part of any Christian tradition. What are they doing on this strange specter ship? And they literally play dice. And the woman, the nightmare, life and death, wins. The game is done. I've won, I've won. And she's won just the life of the ancient mariner, none of the rest of the crew. So that is an, another mystery. What does this symbolize? What force do they represent? How are they allowed to play dice? Any modern reader will always think of Einstein. I do not believe that God plays dice with the universe. Here, the two figures are playing dice in that sense.
the whole crew die, but as they lie dead, they curse the ancient mariner. And this is one of the most powerful parts of the poem, the curse in a dead man's eye. Extraordinary descriptions of that. And the overwhelming guilt that the mariner feels. And in a way, that is the most terrible experience. It's more terrible than the drought he experiences, more terrible than the loneliness. It's the sense that the entire crew blame him for what's happened. And even after they're dead, they still blame him. The mariner all alone, and the famous passage, looks out on the sea, sees the beautiful sea creatures, and he blesses them unaware in this terrible, lonely, guilt-ridden state. For one moment, he's carried out of himself, and he just sees how beautiful the sea creatures are. And in the famous words, a spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. And that's the moment that the albatross falls from his neck. But his sufferings are not yet over. The dead crew rise up and man the ship. And the polar spirit, who we've heard rumors of, who apparently looked after the albatross, comes and drives the ship northwards back towards home. And it's so, the power of that, with the polar spirit nine fathoms deep beneath the ship, puts the mariner in a swoon, a swan. And while he's in that state, he hears another set of hallucinations. They're building up these illusions. They're very complicated. Two figures, two voices. And basically they say, the mariner's penance is not yet finished. This is managed beautifully well in the Fiona Shaw performance, the way these two figures are played by Daniel uh, Hay Gordon, Hay Gordon um, with a double mask. And again, we have one more layer of hallucination and one more layer of problems. Who are these voices? How do they control the mariner? Why do they know he's doing penance? In what sense? Is that religious penance or something else? So that problem is raised. And then the mariner suddenly finds himself back in home port. And the action is very, very rapid now that a pilot ship boat, rowing boat, puts out from the home port with the pilot boy and an ancient hermit a holy man, and they come alongside the ship, and at that moment, the polar spirit sinks the boat, and the mariner alone survives in the water, and he's put in the ship, and he rows. He stands up and rows. And the other, the hermit, is almost speechless, and the pilot boy goes mad. He has that famous phrase, the devil knows how to row. So there's an extraordinary... Uh, uh, transformation there that the mariner for a moment to the people back on that looks like a, a devil-like figure because of what he's been through and he says when he's back on line he asks the hermit to give him redemption and he says in his famous line I've been alone on a wide wide sea and he obviously means more than an ordinary ocean, something else, a sea of the spirit. And the question is, in what sense has been, in, and was he, was, it, was he deserved to be alone and suffering like that? Was he truly guilty? And finally, we get the end of the poem where he, the mariner has to tell anybody he meets his story, compulsive repetition. And of course, it was the wedding guest that he fell upon at the beginning of the poem. So it has a circular movement, and by now the mariner is indeed ancient. And we're left with the idea the poem circles round, he's going to stop the next wedding guest, and he's going to tell his story again, and again, and again, and there may be no end to that sequence. So that's a very quick outline 
just to remind you of the poem. Um, the main thing there, I think, are the complications and the mysteries of it. That's what I've tried to underline. And now I want to just take you back behind the story as a biographer and give you a few details and we'll, we'll have a look at how it looks in biographical terms. Now there is Coleridge in 1797, young man, been born in 1772 in the West Country. He went to Cambridge as his friend Wordsworth did. He had, he was the youngest of nine children. He had quite a, he was a brilliant young child, amazingly talkative, could never stop talking. Something happened throughout his life, he never stopped talking. Um, amazingly well read, particularly in philosophy and travel books and poetry. Um, he, in effect, is thrown out of Cambridge. He goes and joins the Dragoons, 14th Light Dragoons, runs away to the army, where after something like a year, uh, he's discharged, and I've seen the paper, they still have it in their regimental um, uh, offices, framed. It's Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who's then known as Cumberback, discharged, insane. And, and they've, they've got that document still there. Um, he then meets Robert Southey, and he's planning to come to America in Pantasocracy, and he marries. And then he's in the West Country, and he meets Wordsworth. I just want to um, read you for a moment a description of um, Coleridge, how he describes himself at that moment um, to a friend in the letter. He says, um, my face, unless when animated by immediate eloquence, expresses great sloth <laughs> and great, indeed, almost idiotic good nature. It is a mere carcass of a face. My gait, my walk, is awkward, and the walk and the whole man indicate indolence capable of energies. I have read almost everything. I am a library cormorant. I am deep in all out-of-the-way books, metaphysics, poetry, facts of the mind, travel. Of useful knowledge, I am a so-so chemist. I love chemistry. All else is rather blank, but with luck, and please God, I will be an agriculturist and a farmer. Anything less likely than courage as a farmer, I cannot imagine. <laughs> I cannot breathe through my nose, so my mouth with sensual thick lips is almost always open, not in that picture. In conversation I am impassioned and impose what I, oppose what I deem error with an eagerness which is often mistaken for personal anger. But I am ever so swallowed up in the thing that I f perfectly forget my opponent. Such am I. Uh, the one thing that strikes me about that is, it's, of course, it's very, very self-mocking. And it's very funny. And the humour, a thing that one might not necessarily associate with the ancient mariner, although there are moments in Fiona Shaw's performance when this comes out, is very important to the way this poem got created. So bear that in mind. He's met in the West Country William Wordsworth. This is a slightly older photograph. Wordsworth, who had also been to Cambridge, who'd then gone to revolutionary France, who had experienced the early uh, time of the, the guillotine, um, and had also heard Robespierre talk. Uh, so that was quite an experience politically for him. Came back feeling very alienated uh, in England, politically alienated and socially alienated, and went to live with his beloved sister Dorothy Wordsworth in the West Country, and that's the way, by chance, he met Coleridge. And Dorothy, almost the only known picture of her, his younger sister, the great journal keeper. Now she starts a journal almost immediately after the Mariner has been written. So we know one of her earliest entries is Coleridge arrives having finished The Mariner. But she was involved, like Wordsworth, as we will see, um, in 
the composing of it. And one of the great uh, frustrations of biographical literature is we will never know how much Dorothy was actually involved in the composing of the poem. We know Wordsworth was, and we'll come on to that, but she may well have been. This um, is the cottage that Coleridge was living in at the time. It still exists, um, and you can, um, you can visit it. Uh, in fact, uh, let me just quote from this, because uh, recently, uh, Coleridge Cottage as a museum became one of the, the London Times' top 50 museums in the world to visit. This is what they wrote in the Times. Lovingly restored by local subscription and the National Trust, this tiny but intensely atmospheric writer's museum has become one of England's hidden gems of literary remembrance. Here, Coleridge wrote many of the masterpieces of early romantic poetry, including The Ancient Mariner. You can inspect manuscripts and letters from that magic time. Learn about his walks with Wordsworth and Dorothy in the surrounding Quantock Hills and see the very far side where he sat composing with his baby Hartley on his knee. You can even examine the dragoon sword which he abandoned for the poet's quill. Don't miss the enchanting garden at the back, just reopened, where you can retreat to Coleridge's own arbour and listen to recordings of his poems in the shade, including The Ancient Mariner. Pretty nice to get in the top 50 museums of the world. Um, and I wrote the description for the time. <laughs> like that. Um, see, um, Wordsworth was living three miles away. This is, I put his apartment. Um, he'd actually got rooms in that. And again, that still exists, that house. A bit ramshackle, it's a ho uh, hotel now. Uh, and you can see, and I'll show you a bit more, the one for countryside. So you, we have to have this picture with um, Coleridge uh, in, in his house there, living with his wife and his first baby, Hartley, and Dorothy and William Wordsworth, three miles away um, at the bigger house, Al Foxton, and them going for walks um, over the Quantock Hills, uh, which I think I have a picture of. All right. That's still there. I go there every year, uh, and it is still as beautiful. Um, this is what Wordsworth wrote about that. That summer, under whose indulgent skies, upon smooth Quantock's airy ridge, we roved, unchecked, or loitered mid her sylvan combs. Thou, in bewitching words, with happy heart, did chant the vision of that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And that's from Wordsworth's Prelude a very fond and passionate remembrance of that time, and you can still rover over that hillside. Now, they went on these walks together, the three of them. Uh, very rarely, Coleridge's wife, which is a very interesting subject which we come back to, but it was the three of them who walked together, and they were discussing various kinds of poems uh, which eventually would form that famous correction, the lyrical ballads in the following year, we're in 1797 now and in 1798. And they were discussing particularly the ideas for poems which either reflected natural imagery or something supernatural. And again, just probably worth um, listening to what um, Coleridge said about this. It was agreed that my endeavours should be directed to persons and characters supernatural or at least romantic, yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and a semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of the imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. And that's one of the most famous critical phrases. You will see it regularly appears, even in newspapers now, using, using critical language, the willing suspension of disbelief. Complicated, subtle idea, the willing suspension of disbelief, accepting what you believe cannot be true, but accepting for poetic reasons. 
A very interesting proposition. And he wrote that phrase specifically with the mariner in mind. So he's saying, we don't believe in one sense what happens in this poem, but we willingly suspend our disbelief in order, as he puts it, to learn something about human nature. So that's a little theoretical background behind it. And further, we know that they wanted to write together a poem about the origins of evil. Very interesting idea. Two young men in their 20s, uh, they want to write ballads, but they want to explore the idea of evil for very interesting social and political reasons. And you'd think, what would you choose? I'm sure there are writers in the audience. If you were writing about evil, I don't think you'd choose shooting an animal. You might. But what the first idea they had was the old biblical story of Cain and Abel, that Cain kills his brother Abel. Classic expression of an act of evil. And they did write a prose beginning to that together. And then they tried a ballad called The Three Greys, which is about domestic evil. Um, it is about a family in which a mother-in-law, interesting that that was chosen, has an evil influence on her daughter. Um, and that is a very interesting subject. And they began to write that together. And Coleridge tells us that Wordsworth wrote the beginning and then passed it over to him and he went on and then they could do nothing with it. So they were still looking for the idea of a poem about evil. And then the idea for the mariner came up. And I want to read you now, and this is a, a significant thing because it's always, always given. Um, if you study this uh, as a literary student, it's Wordsworth's claim to um, have given courage so many of the ideas for the book, for the poem. This is Wordsworth long after the event. Think of the possible rivalries between authors later on. Much the greatest part, much the greatest part of the story was Mr. Coleridge's invention. But certain parts I myself suggested. For example, some crime was to be committed which should bring upon the old navigator as Coleridge afterwards delighted to call him the spectral persecution as a consequence of that crime and his own wanderings. I had been reading, I had been reading in Shelvock's voyages a day or two before that while doubling Cape Horn they frequently saw albatrosses in that latitude. Suppose, I said, you represent him as having killed one of those birds on entering the South Seas and that the tutelary spirits of those regions take upon them to avenge the crime. The incident was thought fit for the purpose and adapted accordingly. I also suggested the navigation of the ship by the dead crewmen, but do not recall that I had anything more to do with the scheme of the poem, i.e. virtually all of it. And as a biographer, I want to go back and see how closely that could be true. Now, if you go right back to Coleridge's early childhood, I, told, I said at the beginning that he was an extraordinary reader. I, I've read everything. I'm a library cormorant. We know what he read as a child. He recorded it in, later, in letters before writing The Mariner. And one of them was The Surprising Adventures of Philip Quarle. And this is a man who um, was marooned on an island, a seaman. And the book told of his sufferings and surprising adventures. And one of them was the shooting of a large and beautiful seabird with a homemade bow, an action he immediately regrets. I have destroyed that was certainly made for nature's diversions with such a variety of beauty and of colours. Now that Coleridge read we know 
when he was probably four years old. So the idea was already there. Next, he was fascinated by um, the hierarchy between human beings and animals. So animal rights was not a new thing. All right? And let me just demonstrate that from a little later period when he got to Cambridge. Um, and he wrote uh, this extraordinary letter to a friend about when they were planning Frank Pantasocracy to come to America, that they would be on equal terms with nature and with animals. I am their brother. This is his letter. I call even my cat sister in the fraternity of universal nature. Owls I respect and jackasses I love. And then it becomes satirical. As for aldermen hogs, bishops and Royston crows, I have no particular partiality and so on. All right. And indeed he wrote and published, while he was at Cambridge, a poem which contains this line, Innocent foe, thou poor, despised, forlorn, I hail thee, brother, spite of the fool's scorn, and fain I take thee with me in the dell of high-souled pantasocracy to dwell. So that's to um, a small young horse, a foal, that poem. And I may say he was mocked for years after for publishing that poem, including by Byron, and he was called the laureate of the long-eared kind. So that's what it is uh, to um, promote animal rights. Um, but so you see what I'm gradually building here, that Coleridge was uh, very well preparing himself for the kind of story that the mariner follows. Um, then there's the question of the hallucinations. Um, I discovered that when he was a dragoon, he was the most hopeless dragoon. He kept falling off his horse. And the army, who know how to look after their young troopers, uh, seconded him to uh, a small town uh, near London called Henley, you know, Henley on Thames, where they had a pest house where sick dragoons were isolated. And they gave young dragoon courage the job of nursing a fellow dragoon in the Henley pest house who had smallpox, an almost fatal disease. And he was put in this brick pest house, which still exists, for significantly seven days and seven nights. And the food and the water was put through the door in buckets, significant thing. And his fellow de Groon went through the most terrible hallucinations, screaming and raving and seeing things. And courage, and it gives you an idea, and now a slightly different idea of the kind of man. Courage nursed that de Groon. He stayed with him all the time. He brought him through, and the, his fellow dragoon survived. And that was shortly before Courage was discharged insane. All right? Now, there's a record of that. So he'd been through that experience, and it's the most vivid account he writes in his letters. Now, when he gets to uh, Stowe, to the cottage, and we're getting now very close to the time of the mariner, he has another animal experience, uh, which, again, I feel I must read you. Um, if I can find the little text. Um, they had problems, his wife had problems, with mice in the cottage. And to her understandable irritation, Courage refused to set traps. Um, and this is his explanation, again in a letter. The mice play the very devil with us. It irks me to set a trap. By all the whiskers, I'm reading exactly what he wrote, by all the whiskers of all the kittens that have ever mewed, plaintively or amorously, since the days of Dick Whittington, it is not fair. Tis telling a lie. Tis as if you said, here is a bit of toasted cheese. Come, little mice, I invite you. When, oh, foul breach of the rights of hospitality, 
I mean to assassinate my two credulous guests. All right. Now, I said that humor was a very important part uh, of the creative process with courage. And here is the little prose summary he put to the 1800 version um, of the Mariner. How a ship, having passed the line, was driven by storms to the coal country towards the South Pole, and how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean. How the ancient mariner, cruelly and in contempt of the laws of hospitality, killed a seabird, and how he was followed by many and strange judgments. So exactly the same idea as the joke about the mice and the profound question in the poem of in some ways he has been cruelly and in contempt of the laws of hospitality. Now that's something that a biographer can find. And that mixture between Coleridge, the, the non-stop joking, talking, punning Coleridge, and the Coleridge, the metaphysical Coleridge, who suddenly sees within this a very profound thing about our relationship with nature, that the laws of hospitality, we in some way have to respect and indeed celebrate the laws of hospitality. And maybe that is what the mariner has broken. Now, the plan for the lyrical ballads didn't initially include um, this particular poem. Um, but as they were talking it out, they did indeed come across the book that Wordsworth referred to as Shelvock's book, uh, which is the voyage about um, uh, going around the globe where the albatross is shot. And I want to read you this, Voyage Around the World, Shelvock, 1726. Now, Wordsworth claimed he found that, but it's quite clear that they both read it together. And it would leap out at anybody the dramatic center. Here's the account. When they went into the uh, Antarctic Ocean, there was uh, no creatures nor one seabird, except, and this is from Shelvock's account, a disconsolate black albatross who accompanied us for several days, hovering about us as if he had lost himself, till Hatley, my second captain, observing in one of his melancholy fits that this bird was always hovering near us, imagined from his colour that he might be some ill omen, which I suppose induced him the more to encourage his superstitions. After some fruitless attempts, be that as it may, at length he shot the albatross, not doubting perhaps that we should have a fair wind after it. And there immediately is the question of superstition. Why did he do it? In a melancholy fit, says Shelvock. And you can see um, Coleridge immediately latching onto this. Here is a fascinating idea, a syndolic gesture which brings terrible evil with it. And the mystery of the character of the mariner, Hatley in a melancholy fit. We know there were other uh, bits of material that fed into it. Their local land agent, who uh, acquired both our Foxton House and Stowey, the Stowey Cottage for Coleridge and for Wordsworth, a man called Gro John Cruikshank, who um, loved to talk to them. And he told them, both of them together, about a dream he'd had in which a ship was manned and sailed by a dead crew. We know that piece of information. So do you see all these bits of information from the comic mouse, Philip Quall, who shot the beautiful seabird, were feeding in to Coleridge. So the idea that Wordsworth can claim to have been the co-author, I find as a biographer very difficult to accept. Let's go in a tiny bit closer uh, and look at the walk, just for a moment, which produced the poem. It was composed, my notes say, on the hoof. There's a wonderful description by William Hazlitt, 
who went to visit them both at this time down in the Quantock Hills. And he said he noticed that both the poets liked to compose while walking. But there was this difference that Wordsworth liked to compose while he was striding steadily, ideally, on a graveled path. And we know in later life he used to do it with an umbrella. Wonderful image. Never forget it. Wordsworth composing, walking up and down a gravel path with an umbrella. Coleridge liked to do it when he was scrambling through undergrowth, says Hazlitt, preferably up a steep hill and falling back half the time. Ah, what a wonderful symbol. So, they liked to compose together walking, and we know that they went up this particular hill. Let's see if I can actually come up with it. 24. A hill which I'm very fond of. This is Longstone Hill in the woods above our Foxton and the Stowey Cottage. There's beautiful beech trees. They're still here. And that's one of the things I'm, I think I'm saying that the poem and the source of the poem are still alive and can still be visited. And I've often, usually every year, I walk up that hill. And we know from Dorothy's diary that they set out at a particular day the 13th of November, and we know what time it was, 4.30, winter evening. So they set out deliberately towards sunset, and they went over the top of the Quantock Hills um, as the sun was setting and the moon started coming out. And those two images, the sun and the moon, are so important. And they came down the hill, talking all the while in the dark, to the harbour at Watch It. And that's the modern harbour at Watchit. And there, the extraordinary thing, there is now a statue of the ancient mariner put up 200 years later, 1798. Um, and it's rather touching because it's, that it's a still a fishing, fisherman's harbour. So there he is standing among the modern fishermen. And again, you can go and visit that. And we know that that walk lasted only seven days, seven nights and seven days. And by the time Courage got back, and returned to the cottage, he'd written the first half of the poem. Amazing rapidity, 300 lines of it. But he did take until March next year, 1798, to finish it. Um, and the question of how he worked on it is very, very important. People think that there's one fixed version of the Mariner. In fact, there were three separate versions. Um, the first one was published as the first poem, finally, in the Lyrical Ballads, and Tintin Abbey, Wordsworth's poem, was the last. Uh, and that was very quickly done in, in 1798, and in fact they were brought together in Germany when it was published. And the main thing about that, it's, it's a slightly longer poem, and it's completely in antique words, even ancient, spelt with a Y, and it's full of very strange rhymes using words like F soon and so on. Um, and Wordsworth critiqued this. And again, this is, I find this quite extraordinary. When the um, poem was published in the 1800 edition, Wordsworth first of all moved it to the middle of the lyrical ballads, away from the front. And he attached this prose introduction. Uh, the poem of my friend, is fine, but it has great defects. First, that the principal person has no distinct character, either in his profession of mariner or as a human being, having been long under the control of supernatural impressions, might be supposed to partake of something supernatural himself. Secondly, he does not act, but is continually acted upon. And thirdly, that the events have no necessary connection, do not produce such in each other. And lastly, that the imagery is somewhat too laboriously accumulated. Isn't that extraordinary? He published that in the 1800 edition. And you might say that everything he picked out as a criticism, including the wonderful imagery, is exactly the reason that we now value that poem. But Coleridge did, in fact, uh, modernize it to some extent, um, and he took out uh, some of the more problematic um, um, anachronistic terms, uh, and he shortened it to some degree. 
And that was in 1800. And then there's a third version in 1817. So we've now got 20 years, 20 years this has taken to compose that poem. Um, and he's um, provided a gloss, that is to say a prose commentary, which runs alongside the poem. And he also provides an introduction. And the extraordinary thing about this is the, ca the prose gloss is written in the character of a 17th century theologian or critic. And he provides at the beginning a genuine epigraph from Thomas Burnet, who was indeed a 17th century philosopher and critic. And what he emphasizes in this is the invisible spirits that surround the ship. Let me read you. And this now is added to the argument, which I read you the short one about shooting uh, the albatross. I can easily believe that there are more invisible creatures in the universe than visible ones. But who will tell us what family each belongs to, what their ranks and relationships are, and what their respective distinguishing characters may be? What do they do? Where do they live? Human wit has always circled around a knowledge of these things without ever attaining it. But I do not doubt that it is beneficial sometimes to contemplate in the mind, as a picture, the image of a grander and better world. For if the mind grows used to trivial things in daily life, it may dwindle too much and decline altogether into worthless thoughts. Meanwhile, we must be on the watch for the truth, keeping a sense of proportion so that we can tell what is certain from what is uncertain and day from night. Now that's by Thomas Burnet, a uh, text written in 1692, and Coleridge puts that at the beginnings of the 1817 version um, of The Mariner. And there is uh, the tremendous uh, emphasis then on the spirit such as the polar spirit now, I wanted to show you that because um, this is from the very first illustrated edition and it was uh, drawn in 1832 so Coleridge himself could see these pictures. And in this first David Scott version, there is terrific emphasis on the world of spirits uh, that are opened up through the hallucinations of the mariner. Uh, Coleridge um, apparently liked the illustrations, although he said he thought that the nature of the poem was very difficult to draw because of its metaphysical content. And he made one very interesting point. He said that in, in that David um, Scott's version, he made the mariner ancient throughout. And he said, of course, that's not the situation. The mariner who sails south is very, very young. And it's only when he comes back and begins compulsively to retell his story again and again that he becomes the ancient mariner. So that's a reference to the complexity of the time schemes in the poem. And then there's the whole question uh, of the spectership, the dicing of death, and the death of the d dicing for the lives of the crew. And this he alters quite considerably and expands in that 1800, 1817 edition. Uh, and we'll look at that, but one further thing I want to emphasize here is he emphasizes the moon and sun imagery, which is so, so important. Um, and in the gloss, and I perhaps I'll read you just a section of this, because I find this particularly, to me, it seems quite extraordinary. There's this section here. This is... Um, just before, it's from the end of part three, just before the albatross falls off his neck. Uh, it, it's the worst moment when he refers to the orphans. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. And I showed you that picture. And it's followed by this stanza. 
the moving moon went up the sky. And maybe I've got an illustration for this. Yes. The moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up with a star or two beside. And this image is, arrives at the extreme moment of the mariner's loneliness. But again, he looks up into a wider universe and this very beautiful image of the moving moon. And in this 1817 edition, Coleridge adds as one of the glasses this, and I just want to read it to you. It seems to me very beautiful and very puzzling. And remember, it's in the voice of the another character he's created, who is the 17th century critic who's looking at this poem. In his loneliness and fixedness, he yearneth towards the journeying moon and the stars that still sojourn, yet still move onward. And everywhere the blue sky belongs to them and is their appointed rest and their native country and their own natural homes, which they enter unannounced as lords that are certainly expected, and yet there is silent joy at their arrival. That seems to me extraordinary, a prose poem of its own, this very complicated idea of a homecoming that is expected, and then there's silent joy. And this is what's going through the mariner's mind as he looks upward, and he's in the least home. He's solitary out there on the ocean, but he looks up, and this is what is going through his mind. As I say, that's just before the famous lines of happy living things, no tongue, their beauty might declare, a spring of love gush from my heart, and I bless them unaware. So his focus has started in the sky and the moon and the stars with that wonderful passage, and then moves down to the beauty of the animals. And that somehow, that knowledge, that response to the outside universe, up there and down there in the sea, releases him. And that seems to me a very important part in the, if one is making some kind of spiritual interpretation of what the poem is about. Now, I want to also look at a very, very strange passage, um, which is the dicing for the lives. There's, I thought, on the whole, I don't like putting up text, but let me just um, let you read that for a moment. Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin was white as leprosy. The nightmare life in death was she, who six man's blood was cold. That seems to me one of the most extraordinary hallucinations in the entire poem. Who is this woman? Why is it a woman? Why is it the woman who wins the mariner's life? Somebody said, there's no other woman in the poem. There is, of course. The other woman is the bride, who appears at the beginning and at the end. Red as a rose is she, right? So we ha seem to have these two absolutely opposed, we might say, female principles. I don't know. But there they are. And this has absolutely fascinated the um, illustrators of the poem. And I'm saying to you how important that is. I just want to take you through some of those. That's the original Gustav Dore, um, which in a sense, it kind of, it centers on the death figure and it blurs the nightmare life and death. She's a small figure, um, almost childlike um, among the rigging of the specter ship. Now look what happens um, when a Victorian illustrator gets at this, an English one. All right. Now that is a very powerful and strange and obviously sexual image, I think. Um, and it has its uh, excellent piece of draft work. Look, if you look carefully, the way the bones um, of the skeleton of death are in, are in a sort of dance with the woman. She's celebrating that she's won, she's won the mariner's life. Um, but it, it's extraordinary, it seems to sort of burst out of 
the imagery of the poem, but that's how the illustrator has looked at it. There, again, um, an almost, uh, note the date there, it, it's, there are sort of Art Nouveau elements there, almost an Egyptian element there. And you can just see the, the dice held in the top of the hands there. Um, and again, very strange, almost perverse image there has been taken, death confronting this naked figure. Um, and again, it seems to be bursting out of the original imagery of the poem. This is David Jones, the great um, uh, carver and uh, graphic artist and illustrator. And there, again, something, something almost humorous has happened there. Um, she's wearing a kind of garter. She's, I won't say a can-can figure, but do you see what I mean? Um, and, and death, again, is, is dancing with his, his game board there. Um, and again, the imagery seems to have broken out of the poem, or at least given us a new account of it. Now, these, in a way, are quite benign images, but I want to take you one stage further, and this is by Mervyn Peake, the great English author of strange Gothic novel, Gormenghast. And he illustrated the entire poem, and this is what he came up for the light nightmare life and death. Now, which he seems to have combined the death figure, the skeleton, with the female figure. And again, absolutely haunting, I think, a, a kind of night, nightmare image. Um, and I think one here, a modern one there for the Folio Society, uh, but in a way, the one that, that stays in one's mind, I think, is that in an extraordinary way. And what it seems to me, I thought a lot about this, um, it seems to me that what Coleridge has done again and again, and why it appeals to illustrators, is he releases a particular visual image that the poem doesn't entirely explain, but has extraordinary power in it, extraordinary suggestive power. We were looking at the moon and the stars. I personally can never look at a moon now with one star like that without immediately thinking, that line, the moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide, softly she was going up, etc. Always just comes straight to my heart, that. Uh, and it seems to me in s many places in this poem that he re re releases these very powerful visual images that carry all kinds of metaphysical overtones. And the uh, illustrators respond to that. Uh, and they change over time. So the modern illustrators respond in a different way way from the original ones. And so that sequence of the spectorship seems to me to illustrate that very, very well. Um, there's also um, the way um, the covers are presented. Let me just go down through back to the folio. Now, that's a Charles Rickett cover, uh, dating 1890, of wonderful simplicity, bare, sums almost itself like a sh ship on the ocean. And then we get, in 1910, a very, very highly decorated one by the Hungarian artist, Willy Pagani. And then that by Duncan Grant, a great friend of Virginia Woolf, uh, the, the ship on the pa painted ship upon a painted ocean, very soft one, and incidentally responding to the colors. Um, it's one of the great powerful things, I think, in the poem, that uh, extraordinary range of colours that are produced by the moon and the sun and so on. And there, incidentally, is an Alexander Calder poem uh, cover. Uh, Calder, who did the great mobiles, you remember? Um, and uh, there he is a kind of mobile hanging um, mariner, w which in a way is, is picked up again in in the Fiona Shaw production, that kind of figure. Now, I said that modern, modern um, illustrators uh, respond in many different ways, and I knew we're almost time for questions. So just to, um, as it were, let the albatross among the thing, I wanted you to see this. Oh, this is a British illustrator. All right. And he, ha this, this is um, Aunt Emerson. 
do has done the most beautiful, actually, very amusing, slightly devilish version of the entire Mariner as a graphic novel in this way. And you will never think of the albatross in quite the same <laughs> way, having seen that, I think. And we could go much, much further. For example, um, that's an Iron Maiden heavy metal band. Uh, and I found the lyrics, and they're amazingly close to the original. He's edited them down a bit, and the noise is of a particular kind. Of it and just, uh, <laughs> but uh, that just to show you the extraordinary impact the poem continues to have. Now, there are many other things I could talk about, and I hope we will. One is um, Coleridge's later career, but I've explained to you how the poem runs right through it. And I can also show you uh, some pictures of portraits of Coleridge himself as he goes through life. But let's pause it at the moment, um, and let's hope I've encouraged some questions and that you'll never think about the mariner quite the same way again. Thank you very much. And we'll ask, if you have a question, we'll ask that you wait until you, we bring you the microphone, because otherwise the people that are following us on the live stream will not hear it. So, doesn't... I wonder if you could comment on the the cultural uh, history that establishes one version of the Mariner over the others. So that it, it actually surprises me that we don't automatically, when, if we buy a copy, we don't get the variations. Yes, I mean, the, I, one how you say the cultural, uh, cultural context in a way, uh, and one very interesting area of discussion is the way this goes out into European poetry, because of course it's translated. And Baudelaire, in fact, writes a famous poem called The Albatross. Uh, with the poet is like the albatross with his great wings, who when he's flying, he's above the mockery, but once he's landed, his wings prevent him getting off the earth again. Rambo's The Drunken Boat obviously in some way reflects America. So there's a whole European context in which this happens. I think in as far as knowing, uh, having what I've referred to as the layered interpretations, um, I think it's one of the extraordinary things about poetry. Uh, Goethe said this rather remark, genius is proved in posthumous productivity, i.e. the work that you do continues to uh, expand and recreate itself. And I'm waiting uh, for a full-scale uh, Mariner ballet. I think there has been one. There are numerous readings you can get. Fiona Shaw's will be a classic. But for instance, there is a Richard Burton reading, which you can download. Um, there's a Michael Redgrave, which is very good. Uh, Fiona Shaw, I think, is the first woman's reading. And therefore, it's particularly striking, I think. So it is a multi-layered thing and I be interesting how you would um, how would you um, actually publish a single edition of the the Mariner um, which showed that and I suppose a final point to make there is courage himself he's always aware of what's going on if you remember in the Kublai Khan it's famous for the preface which explains that he had over 300 lines of my in Xanadu de Kublai Khan, a state pleasure to tell him to read 300 lines of it. And then he's dreamt it, and he wakes up, and just at that moment, the person on business from Porlock interrupts, so the rest of the poem goes. Now that preface is itself a creative device about describing the nature of imagination, how it's on and off. So he, he already is multi-layering. He does the same thing in the gloss. And I think, he saw, when he first saw the illustration, that first one I showed you, the David Scott, he realized also it was going to have another life in pictorial terms. I'm waiting to see, uh, with some trepidation, the Disney version. <laughs> anyway, so, okay, let's have, thank you for that question. Um. Um. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the, the nature of the, the verse itself, which is so instantly, mem it's so memorable and so captivating, but it contains this, this combination of almost a childlike yes. sing-song quality. And I, I, thought about, I thought about that as, as the, you were describing the, the long walking um, process of, yes. of thinking and composition. It's absolutely true. The, uh, he worked very hard to get this. It's the 
classic ballad stanza, which is basically a four stress, very short line on the page. If you can see, I mean, it just, it, it's what I call a thin poem. That's what it looks like, right, like that. Um, but in fact, he, he alternates his stanza, it's four, four lines of stanza, but in fact, there are six line stanza, and there's actually a nine line stanza, which um, I wonder if I can read that to you, because um, that, that kind of makes the point, really. Um, it's got a lot of in the chanting effect, and it is hypnotic, particularly if you, if you just hear it read, if you ha have a tape of it, or you just listen to it on, on, the, on the internet. It's extraordinary, the effect of rhythm. There's various descriptions of people said it's like a heart beating, or it's like the tide and, and the wave breaking and coming back and breaking and coming back. And it's very carefully worked with a lot of internal rhymes, so the classic four end rhymes, but there's a lot of doubling and internal rhyming and balancing. Let me read you this. This, um, the first stanza is a short one, and this is in the original version. And the second stanza is slightly longer. And this he wrote, it only arrived in the 1817 version. And I happen to know that it arrived as a result of him going to Malta. Uh, he went to Malta during uh, the Revolutionary Wars, at least the wars with France. Uh, uh, his story is always extraordinary. While he was there, he was made assistant to the governor of Malta. Imagine Coleridge, assistant to the governor of Malta. And he copied the last four dispatches that went from Malta to Nelson, just before the Battle of Trafalgar. And they are in Coleridge's hand. Quite, quite extraordinary. Um, and he, he has terrible, both the journey from um, England to Malta and back again two years later are awful. And it suddenly, I realized that he'd never been to sea before. He'd never been to sea when he wrote The Mariner. The nearest bit of sea work, he'd crossed the Bristol estuary. All right, which you, you can look up. And, and so he'd, in, he'd invented this marvelous thing. Now, here's, here's, you'll get the rhythm and then the extended second stanza, which he added. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out. At one stride comes the dark. With far haired whisper o'er the sea, off shot the spectre bark new stanza. We listened and looked sideways up. Fear at my heart as at a cup my lifeblood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night. The steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white from the sails the dew did drip till clomb above the eastern bar the horned moon with one bright star within the nether tip. So there's this extraordinary swinging tidal line with occasional breaks in it. The steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white. That line extends again. And he says he deliberately uses the ballad line so he could extend it and shorten it according to the motion. And then you said the walking. Yes, I think that's right. Um, it is an extraordinary, the effect of walking, he, also, he wrote a lot about walking. You know he was a, one of the first great Lake District walkers and climbed Helvellyn and so on. Um, and, and indeed, um, some, of, some of his accounts are famous. There's a letter he wrote uh, from the top of one to his love, Azra. We haven't even talked about that, there haven't been time for that. Um, but that, the physicality of climbing was very, very important to him. And the rhythm of step afterwards, um, an iambic pentameter means an iambic footstep, right? And that was part of their getting back to the basics of English language and English poetry. And walking, walking a poem into life was what they both believed in doing, with the interesting distinction that, uh, uh, that Hazlitt saw, that they, they walked in very different fashions. Um, and it's funny that when you I refer to walking, going so often myself up on the Quantocks, when I go up there, and it's quite hard when you climb up through the, but you're quite out of breath, and as you get over the top, you're very aware of your feet and your heart going. And there's an extraordinary way that the lines start floating into your mind, because your body has got that rhythm. And somehow the young Coleridge captured that. But the point I also tried to make, he worked very hard to do it, 
and it was 20 years in polishing and finishing this poem. So it's a very good question about the physicality of the verse. Um, and it ca even in the later, Coleridge is an old man. There are passages, and we haven't even talked about that when he was in Highgate, when he still managed to produce this extraordinary tidal effect and songs that he wrote for his play, Osorio, uh, which are, have this same magic. Um, Lamb, Charles Lamb, his great friend, um, I must quote something about Charles Lamb, um, who throughout, I, I've been rather critical of Wordsworth, and Lamb was also very critical of what Wordsworth is saying, and he said he believed it, it was a great poem. For me, I never was so affected by any human tale. After first reading The Mariner, I was totally possessed with it for many days, etc., etc. And And then he, he said this wonderful thing about um, being when Coleridge went to Highgate, I don't know if I can find you this, um, which somehow uh, reflects this. Yeah, um, this is Coleridge much older, 50. In fact, I can show you some pictures of that as we talk. Um, Coleridge is absent but four miles, and the neighborhood of such a man is as exciting as the presence of 50 ordinary persons. It is enough to be within the whiff and wind of his genius, for us not to possess our souls in quiet. I think his essentials not touched. He is very bad, but then wonderfully picks up another day, and his face, when he repeats his verses, hath its ancient glory, an archangel, a little damaged. Wonderful, Charles Lamb. So a lot more to be said about that. But uh, incidentally, I, I would add, I don't know what people feel about this, I think the learning of poetry in schools and so on should be brought back again. We were talking earlier about this, um, ab about Molly remembers and was quoting to me some courage and also some Chaucer. I do think learning by heart, particularly when you're younger and it's easy to, to do it, makes you understand the physical qualities of poetry. And what's more is you never ever forget it. What you learn up to the age of somewhere around, when's the magic age, 16 or something, it's always, always with you. Um, the one final story there, um, there's during, this is an episode, I, I happened to be talking to um, a man who was a general in the very age, by the time he was quite an ancient mariner general by then, who'd been in that famous Arnhem operation. Do you remember The Bridge Too Far, that big film? And he was one of the British paratroops who was sent. This sounds like a real Corrigian diversion. It will get there, all right. He, he was sent on the other side of the bridge. And you remember, they were isolated because there was a panzer division coming around. And he, trying to get to the bridge, was surrounded by German troops and a tank came out. And he hid one of the local Dutch population, who were very brave and loyal, beckoned him in, took him into the house, and put him in the attic. And he stayed in this attic with German troops all around for two days before he could join the unit at the bridge. The one thing in the attic was an English book, and it was Coleridge's poem, and he read The Ancient Mariner. And he said to me the line, the many men so beautiful about the dead crew. And he said, I've never forgotten it. And when I, I knew my men were being killed all around me, and that poem was the only thing that could speak to me. And he said it, when he taught, what was this, 40 years later, he just recited it to me. So again, I, I raised this question of the metaphysical interpretation. This does have an extraordinary spiritual power, this poem, whichever way you take it. So that, that's my answer to that. Remember the general in the attic reading that poem, the many men so beautiful and very good life. Is there, do we have time perhaps for a couple more questions? that you were talking about. Coleridge thought that his poem was hard to illustrate, yet there are so many striking images. What made it hard to see that illustrative quality to the work? What made it, sorry. I what made it hard for him to see sort of those striking images in a visual way, like to be able to illustrate that? I think, yes. I mean, I think once it was illustrated, he did realize how powerful they were. Uh, again, I mean, this, this is a rather um, an interesting critical question. Um, the Doré pictures I showed you to begin with, which are very gothic and complicated. There's one very strong missing. They're not in color. And the poem is suffused 
with color, and which is dominated. It was a wonderful early critical e essay by the American poet Robert Penn Warren, uh, which is called The Poem of Pure Imagination, which takes the two images of the sun, the red burning sun, and the cool moon, and argues that they control the whole imagery of what's happening in the poem. And there's one thing I would like as a biographer to show you, if I can just come up with this uh, very quickly. Um, yeah. This is the sort of thing that only a biographer can do. This is a 17th century, ast 16th century astronomical clock that hangs in the little church in Ottery St. Mary where Coleridge was born. And we know that as a child, his father was the priest there and also the headmaster, he played in the churchyard and in the church. And the two things in the church were two statues of medieval knight and his wife, and this enormous clock. And it's still there. And when you go in, it's absolute, you cannot help walking up. And it's in the old pattern. The earth is in the center. And the sun then moves around to mark the hours. And then the moon moves around that. And then the stars, you see at the bottom, marks the minutes. Now imagine a four, five, six-year-old child every day looking at that edge. The moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up with a star or two by side. So that kind of imagery I think is very deep in the child uh, courage and goes right on into life. And you, you're able to uh, show that biographically. Um, so that the images are visual in a sense in a non-graphic way for Coleridge. Um, they, they are very distinct and there is a kind of magic lantern quality. And when you're doing a performance of the Mariners, Fiona Shaw answered, well, that is the great difficulty because you're breaking the frame all the time. And there is a kind of flat two-dimensional quality to this poem and the way it unfolds, slide upon slide upon slide. I said it, it's like a movie in that sense. And I don't think Coleridge thought of it in pictorial terms in that sense until he'd seen the first illustration. Uh, and it's, it's rather touching that he did. And I think he was very moved by, because he suddenly saw it would have a, have a new kind of life. Uh, and I showed you that one of, of the spirit. It is a very striking one of the image of the the um, the, the uh, polar spirit riding above the boat. So that's the answer. In other words, I, he was very sensitive to music. Um, when he was in Italy during the Malta period, he went to Italy. He wrote some very interesting notes uh, on some of the pictures there particularly at Dante's Hell, that interested him very much. But on the whole, I don't think he was a great pictorial man, and therefore it must have come as a delight and surprise to him at the end of his life um, that it w the poem would have this new and e extended life. And as to say, it's not yet finished, I think. So, another question. Uh, one or two last questions, if there are any. The woman on the specter ship uh, yes. sort of strikes me as, I think, the figurehead of a boat. You know, the, the figure, yes. yeah. Um, so I just wondered if you w could maybe talk about that a little bit. Could she be something from the cursed ship? And also, yeah. since boats are called she. Yes. Uh, let's go back. Um, let's go back to the. the uh, if we looked at the Mervyn Peak, I, that for a start is a very interesting comment. The yeah. idea that, um, of course, all those ships uh, at that period had figureheads, which were almost always female. So um, the idea, and, and contain a great deal of power being, because they represent the power of the ship. Um, how far, I mean, we go, go back again through those various images, um, and the, uh, the, the Dore, um, that's what Courage was thinking of. I don't know. What would be very interesting, would, uh, from a biographical point of view, would be to talk about his relationship with his mother, with his wife, Sarah, 
and this long, unfulfilled love affair he had with Sarah Hutchinson Azra, to whom he wrote many, many poems. Um, and how far, although this is, most of this is subsequent to the writing of the poem, uh, one of the extraordinary features of the Mariner is it seems to predict what happens later in life. Um, I don't know if I can, this sort of, sort of connects, but worth, again, it's a thing that only a biographer can really do. Um, when, in 1813, he was in the worst throes of opium addiction, and he was trying to withdraw cold turkey on his own. He was in an in a inn in Bath, and I think it was almost one of the worst times in his life. And he wrote this in a letter to Mary Morgan, who was uh, a woman, a fr friend of, of his, uh, Morgan and Mary Morgan, uh, who were looking after the only people who could look after him at that time. And here, here was um, a sort of maternal relationship, which I think was very important to him. This is what he wrote to her. The terrors of the Almighty have been around and against me, and though driven up and down for seven dreadful days and nights by restless pain, like a leopard in a den, yet the anguish and remorse of mind was worse than the pain of the whole body. Now, seven days and nights and so on. This is extraordinary, as if he's living out the sufferings of the mariner that he'd created all that time, 15 years or so before. And again and again, you come up that in his life, um, right at the end of his life, he's um, in Highgate. And I really, I must just take you through, just as, as our time runs out, just, just to show you. Uh, that was the y young Coleridge, all right? Age 22, just before he meets Wordsworth. Then there's the image we know of him. We're not quite sure. That may have been done in 1798 in Germany. Um, wonderful description. Dorothy describing him, his, his rough hair and his bad teeth and his dark brows and he's completely fascinating. You forget the moment he starts talking. This is what, 1804, just before he's going to Malta. This is what he looked like in 1814 just as he's preparing the biographia, um, put on a lot of weight, he looks quite suffering there a lot. A good, anybody who has to st uh, study the biographia in college or anything, or teach it, remember that book was put together during the period he was going through withdrawal. It is the most extraordinary feat that he managed to withdraw largely from opium while he worked on the biographia. And that, the letter I wrote to you, um, was written in 1813, and there he is in 1814. But it took its toll. There he is in 1822, uh, age 50. And there he is at 62 years before he died. Um, so that the mariner stays with him. This is what um, John Stuart Mill, a great philosopher, and his friend John Sterling came up to see Courage at Highgate just about this period. And they wrote this. It's painful to observe Coleridge that with all the kindness and glorious far-seeing intelligence of his eye, there is a glare in it, a light half earthly, half morbid, half morbid. It is the glittering eye of the ancient mariner. And that's what the younger generation saw. So the poem is mysterious in that way, not only in terms of, we were talking about interpretation of the Mount Laring, but biographically, in the way it seems to predict, and we said that one of the interpretations was a confessional one, it seems to predict what then goes on to happen in his later life. And that leaves us with a very mysterious idea of the power of poetry uh, and its extraordinary impact and the way it seems to know things that we don't know, and tell us things that we don't know, because probably the last thing that should finally be said about the mariner is surely it's about not just damaging the albatross, but it's about damaging the natural world. It's a green parable poem. It's about what happens when we carelessly, thoughtlessly, 
break the rules, the rights of hospitality. And it seems to me that's one of the great issues we are now facing ourselves in the 21st century, that problem of the damage we're doing to the planet. And that's largely what this poem is about. And that is why poetry is so extraordinary and why I'm so delighted to have talked to you this evening about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all again for coming. And um, as I said at the beginning, there are some books for sale, and Richard will be graciously taking the time to sign some afterwards. So thank you all again.